Well, hello again and welcome to this 14th lecture in the series dealing with Christian apologetics. And in these lectures, I'm trying to offer you a, a range of approaches. Some of these will be theoretical, some of them will be practical. Some of them will involve looking at specific apologetic issues. Some involve looking at general apologetic approaches. Now, in this lecture, I want to look at a very specific case study in Christian apologetics, which uh, I was actually involved and which helped me to realize just how important apologetics actually is. So in this lecture, which is the penultimate lecture in the series, it's gone very, very quickly, I'm going to focus on the movement that has come to be known as the New Atheism. Now, the New Atheism exploded, I think that's the best word, onto the Western cultural scene in 2006, and actually it, it faded away, I think most people would say, by 2018. So I'm going to begin by talking to you about a blog posting of January 2019 by an influential former new atheist, and that's PZ, or you would say Z, Myers, who's a biologist uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota. His blog posting is called The Train Wreck That Was the New Atheism. So this is an insider to the movement talking about his disillusionment with it. He's an intelligent scientist, and he recalls the enormous optimism of the movement in the first years of the new atheism. He wrote, and I'm posting the address for the site, you can check it out for yourself. I was a new atheist. I promoted it. I happily wore the label. I was initially optimistic we were going to change the culture. I was naive and stupid. Now, new atheism began in 2006 with Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, and as Myers explains, he and his fellow travellers within the New Atheist movement spent the next decade sort of agreeing that there's a kind of unified movement here, while trying to explain it wasn't new, and what unity we had splintered beneath us. I guess it's over now. The New Atheism had a 12-year shelf life. Now, I personally think he's right. So what was this movement all about, and what can we learn from its phenomenal growth in its early stages, and then its implosion and its gradual fragmentation over the next decade or so. And I think it's always good to look at a real-life example when doing apologetics, and I think this is a great one to look at. So let's start our story, but not in 2006, when the new atheism actually emerged on the scene, but rather on Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001, now permanently known, of course, as 9-11. So why start there? Well, let me explain. As I'm sure you all know, on 9-11, um, a series of coordinated suicide attacks were launched against targets in the United States of America by Islamic terrorists. This involved crashing airplanes into buildings. And the impact of these attacks was massive. It reflected, if you like, a worldwide realization that the world had just changed irreversibly. And the Dow Jones index slumped uh, 7% when Wall Street reopened for business. And, as you all know, the war against terror became a dominant theme of the presidency of George W. Bush. And the United States and its allies became enmeshed in conflicts in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. But the important point to appreciate is a public anxiety about the deadly consequences of religious fanaticism began to reach new levels. Now, Richard Dawkins and others have been arguing for years that religion was irrational and dangerous. Actually, people hadn't really paid all that much attention to him. But suddenly, these arguments seemed plausible, they seemed attractive, and actually they seemed deeply relevant given the crisis that people felt was engulfing the West. Someone or someone had to be blamed for 9-11, and in the white heat of anger directed against this outrage, Islamic religious fanaticism became shortened to religious fanaticism and then simply to religion. Religion was the enemy of the West. Now, I know that sounds terribly simplistic, but I want you to understand that this kind of process was going on in people's minds. Religion is dangerous. It's dangerous because it bases itself on faith, which cannot be proved. And Dawkins would play a critically important role in this change in cultural mood, because 9-11 confirmed everything 
he had always believed. Religion was dangerous because it was irrational, and when it failed to win arguments, it resorted to terror instead. Four days after 9-11, Dawkins wrote in a British liberal newspaper, The Guardian, these words. To fill a world with religion or religions of the Abrahamic kind is like littering the streets with loaded guns. Don't be surprised if they are used. Now, that's an incendiary comment. I think people now feel very, very awkward about that, looking back on it. But 9-11 turned out to be the intellectual and the moral launch pad for the new atheism. So how did the movement get its name? What was new about it? Well, the term new atheism was actually invented by a journalist, in this case, Gary Wolfe, back in 2006. And he was writing an article for a British magazine aimed at, and I quote, smart, intellectually curious people who need and want to know what's next. And Wolfe was looking for a snappy slogan to refer to a group of three people who'd attracted media attention through best-selling books advocating atheism, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett. Christopher Hitchens, by the way, came on the scene a year later. And Wolfe hit on the phrase the new atheism to designate this messianic advocation of atheism linked with a scathing criticism of both religious belief and cultural respect for religion. So I guess you want to know what is new about the new atheism. Well, as many people have pointed out, actually, there wasn't really all that much in terms of its intellectual roots. It simply recycled older arguments. And this became particularly obvious from 2007, when the movement gained a new crusader in the form of Christopher Hitchens. And the phrase, the four horsemen, borrowed, of course, in the Book of Revelation, began to, use to be used to refer to these writers who rapidly assumed celebrity status and are now collectively seen as the intellectual and cultural spearhead of a new atheism. But again, what was new about his ideas? Well, they weren't new. Uh, Bruce De Silva of the Associated Press wrote these words after reading God is Not Great, which of course is Chris Hitchens' uh, major work. He writes, Hitchens has nothing new to say, although it must be acknowledged he does say it exceptionally well. My point is that New Atheism simply recycles older ideas that have been around since the 18th century. So nothing new there. But what was new, and what I would suggest to you is actually the defining characteristic of New Atheism, is its rhetoric of ridicule and vilification, and its preference for attention-grabbing headlines rather than careful intellectual arguments. And I'll come back to that later in this lecture. So let's look at these four writers in more detail. Now, the first writer we're going to look at is Sam Harris. And Sam Harris published The End of Faith in 2004. And actually, he wasn't well known at all at that time. But Harris mounted here a powerful rhetorical attack on religion, seeing it as the primary cause of the catastrophe of 9-11. And I think it was what many in American liberal culture wanted and needed to hear. The end of faith bristles with indignation and anger. How could such an outrage take place in a civilized, rational na nation like America? His answer is this. There are a lot of Americans who are actually deeply irrational, namely those who are religious. I have to be frank and tell you that Harris's book, The End of Faith, is frankly, it's a bit weird. The really disturbing parts of Harris's book are not his criticism of religion, which are very um, predictable, but actually his own views. I mean, some of the things he says there are really quite worrying. For example, in one section, after rightly noting that beliefs shape behavior, he argues that, and I quote, some propositions are so dangerous that it may even be ethical to kill people for believing them. This may seem an extraordinary claim, but it merely enunciates an ordinary fact about the world in which we live. And he argues that killing such people could be regarded as a legitimate act of self-defense. Now, to be honest, I find that suggestion utterly stupid and morally repulsive, and actually an awful of other people who otherwise would be atheists do the same. I hope I'm wrong here, but um, 
this seems to me to simply show a new atheism is as irrational and as fanatical as the religious people that criticizes. I don't think Harris wants his readers to draw a conclusion that if certain beliefs cause people to behave in ways that he regards as dangerous, then we should get rid of them, both the beliefs and the people. But his you know, pontifications here do seem to open the door to those people who want to argue that since religion generates violence and hatred, which is a core New Atheist doctrine, then it could be ethical to kill people with these ideas in order to make the world a better place. So frankly, I regard that as being a lightweight piece of, um, of sloganizing. But the real intellectual powerhouses of New Atheism appeared in 2006. And that's when Richard Dawkins published his book, The God Delusion. Now, this is actually a bit of a rambling diatribe, and I think it lacks the rhetorical polish of Christopher Hitchens' later book, God is Not Great, it came out in 2007. But it does compensate for this by a comprehensive critique of uh, religion and an advocacy of atheism. And, you know, in my view, if there's an atheist equivalent to C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, then this is probably it. From the outside, Dawkins makes clear he's engaged on a crusade. Listen to this. If this book works as I intend, he writes, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. Well, I have to tell you, a lot of them weren't. They were just very angry Christians who felt they were being systematically misrepresented and vilified. The third of these writers is the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, who's noted for his interest in exploring the broader cultural implications of Darwin's theory of evolution for human society. And in his book, uh, Breaking the Spell, published in 2006, he set out to show how natural selection has programmed us to believe in God when there's no God to believe him. Now, Dennett's relative lack of verbal aggressiveness and ridicule may well explain why this volume failed to sell as well as other leading works of New Atheism. But the fourth book is Christopher Hitchens' book, God is Not Great. This appeared in 2007, a year after the rest, when in one way he, he was playing catch-up. It's driven by a passionate anger about religion, fueled by 9-11, but interestingly, it's also um, driven by a deep underlying anxiety, namely the obstinate refusal of religion to die out as predicted by secular theorists since the 1960s. And Hitchens seems to be saying, well, let's give it one final push. This is the end of religion at long last. And Hitchens' rhetoric is frankly alarmist. It appeals to a subconscious fear within the West's liberal intellectual elite. We're losing the battle for social dominance. Religion is resurgent. Atheists and skeptics are in mortal danger. And Hitcher ominously warns his readers in one of his more outspoken pronouncements, listen to this, people of faith are in a different ways planning your and my discussion. Now that, in my view, comes close to a rhetoric of hate. Uh, I'm slightly worried about that. But something else you need to know about, and that's that there's an obvious tension between Hitchens and the three other leading proponents of a new atheism, Harris, Dawkins and Dennett. They presented themselves as advocates of a scientific rationalism. But after Hitchens joined the team in 2007, the movement took a much more political stance, in which non-belief and scientific rationality became a political cause in the 9-11 context. Many commentators point to Hitchens causing the new atheism to lurch to the political right and thus to alienate an awful lot of people who once had been its natural supporters. So here's a good question. How did these four people come to be leaders of a movement called the new atheism? Were they elected? Who were they accountable to? Because frankly, they said some very strange things. Well, let's go back to the former New Atheist blogger P.Z. Myers, who I introduced earlier in this lecture. And his argument is that, frankly, these four guys were part of the problem. Let me quote you a few snippets from his landmark blog, The Train Wreck, that was the New Atheism. Who, he asked, put Dennett, Harris, Dawkins and Hitchens in charge? Well, his answer is pretty accurate, and it's this. They made a video in which they appointed themselves the four horsemen. 
And he goes on to make the point that the new atheism was really structureless. So he suggests it was, and I quote, easy for a couple of early popularizers to fill the vacuum. These guys simply took the movement over, and that was a bad thing because they simply brought it into discredit. For Myers, the problem is that these four white middle-class saviors quickly came to dominate conferences and writings. Before long, they become authority figures. And that's a real problem. Again, listen to Myers. For too many people, the four turned into oracles whose dicta should not be questioned and dissent would lead to being ostracized. It only took a year to build a cult of personality. And for Myers, a new atheism quickly morphed into a kind of right-wing populism, fired up by anti-Muslim rhetoric, especially in the writings of Harris and Hitchens. And Myers' final verdict is this. He says the new atheism ended up, as I quote, a shambles of alt-right memes and dishonest hucksters mangling science to promote racism, sexism, and bloody regressive politics. So that's a disillusioned new atheism, talking about where it went wrong. And I want to ask what we can learn from this episode apologetically. What can we learn from its rise in 2006 and its fall in 2018? Now, as I've already noted, the, the launch pad for the movement was a fear of religious extremist violence, which led new atheist writers to argue that religion was intrinsically predisposed towards violence. It wasn't an accident, it is built into the nature of religion. And you know, you still hear this argument today. So let's explore this issue properly and see where it leads us. Now, the idea that religion poisons everything, the subtitle of uh, Hitchens' book, became deeply embedded in New Atheism. For these writers, religion was the root of all evil. It was intrinsically and necessarily dangerous. And Sam Harris offers his own, frankly, maverick and selective readings of central religious texts like the Bible and the Quran to demonstrate they possess an innate propensity to generate violence. So is he right? Well, not really, I have to say. In discussing this, I think we need to draw a very important distinction between our religion and a worldview or an ideology. And both religions like Christianity and secular worldviews like Marxism or Nazism can easily end up demanding allegiance from their followers. And that's why, incidentally, the most successful ideologies or worldviews actually incorporate religious elements, even if they are very secular in their outlook. You might think of the former Soviet Union's use of quasi-religious rituals to mark essentially secular events. For example, your, your first job, a moving house, uh, arrival of a new family member, and so on. Any discussion of religious violence must take into account the very important point that Christianity offers a transcendent rationale for the resistance of violence. Christians shouldn't use violence, even though you and I know that they sometimes do. But that makes them bad Christians, not typical Christians. Because Christians hold that the nature or character of God is made known in Christ, so that his words and actions reveal the character and will of God. And for this reason, it's very important to note that Jesus Christ demonstrated a commitment to non-violence in both his teachings and perhaps more importantly, also in his actions. If you like, he was the object, not the agent of violence. Similarly, instead of meeting violence with violence, rage with rage, Christians are asked to turn the other cheek and not to let the sun go down on their anger. Now, I have no doubt that lots of Christians fail to behave like this. But you know, my point would be that shows they're not really very good Christians. Now, let's agree that Christianity will always stand in need of reformation. I have no doubt, as a historian, that Christian churches have actually used or condoned violence in the past. And we are right to criticize them for doing so. And we are right to ask this sort of thing should stop. Christian institutions, it seems to me, need repeatedly to call themselves back to reflect on the core ideas and values of Christ. Above all, the importance of forgiveness and the resistance of violence. 
and therefore we can give a counter-narrative to those offered by Dawkins and Hitchens. Let me give you one of those counter-narratives, which is uh, something that happened in October 2006, which is shortly after the publication of Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. And these are what's sometimes called the Amish schoolhouse killings of October 2006. You probably know the story. A gunman broke into an Amish school in the village of Nickel Mines in the state of Pennsylvania and gunned down a group of schoolgirls. Five of those young girls died. And the gunman shot himself at the scene, leaving a suicide note that he was filled with hate against God. Now, I think you know all about the Amish. They're a very conservative Protestant religious group who repudiate any form of violence on account of their understanding of the absolute moral authority of the person and teaching of Jesus Christ. And despite the brutal force used against the most vulnerable members of their community by a man with some kind of grudge against God, the Amish community urged forgiveness. There would be no violence. There would be no revenge, only the offering of forgiveness. Now, you see, that story needs to be told because it subverts this monolithic myth that you find in the writings of Dennett, Dawkins and Harris, namely that religion causes violence. And the government's widow spoke gratefully and movingly of how this provided the healing that she and her three children so desperately needed. And my point is that the cycle of violence, cycle of revenge, was actually broken before it began. The offering of forgiveness ended the matter. I think this tragic and heroic story challenges churches to bring their ethics into line with those of Christ. But you know it's an even greater challenge to the plausibility of a new atheist critique of religion as intrinsically violent. Christ doesn't fit that mould and actually neither should Christians as well. So I think that's a very important point to make. You must tell counter-narratives to challenge narratives that are told which seem to imply that religion is intrinsically and necessarily violent. But here's another point I think you need to make. What about atheist violence against religion? Now, actually, the, the four horsemen are very conspicuously silent on this, precisely because they are obviously vulnerable here. Let's look at the Soviet Union uh, during the time of its atheism, when the League of Militant Atheists operated from 1925 to 1947. And they argued that good Soviet citizens ought to embrace a scientific, atheistic worldview. Actually, rather like those offered by Dawkins and Harris. And as a result of this, churches were closed or destroyed, often by dynamiting. Priests were imprisoned, exiled or executed. On the eve of the Second World War, there were only 6,000 or so clergy remaining in the Russian Orthodox Church whereas there have been 66,000 before the revolution. Likewise, in 1917, there were more than 39,000 churches in Russia. By 1940, only 900 remained operational. Now, Christopher Hitchens has a very interesting response to this observation. He argues that actually the Soviet Union was repressive precisely because it was a religious state. Communism became a religion, and that's when things turned nasty. Now, that's simply a very unpersuasive argument. It simply brings out to me the obvious truth that any worldview or religion can get nasty and authoritarian and then start imposing its views by force. And that's what happened to atheism in the Soviet Union. It shows that God is not the necessary cause of oppression or violence. Ideas can do that just as well, including atheism, which very often seems, because it's defined oppositionally, to generate violence, to suppress its alternatives. Let's turn to one of the most interesting features of New Atheism, which you see especially in the works of Harris, Dennett and Dawkins, and that is the weaponizing of the natural sciences in their battle against religion. So we're looking now at weaponizing science, and this of course all depends on the New Atheists perpetuating the myth of a warfare between science and religion. Now, in my view, New Atheism does more than simply reflect this outdated cultural stereotype. It actually depends upon this discredited myth for its plausibility. 
But there is, I have to tell you, a massive problem. You know, back in the 1960s, it was very easy to believe in the myth that science is the enemy of religion. But massive historical scholarship has shown this simply wasn't true in the past. Things are much more complex than this oversimplification allows. Sure, there were territories, uh, skirmishes, there are all kinds of things going on, but sometimes there was synergy, sometimes there was tension. But the key point is that things are complicated. The natural sciences can only describe and analyze the forms and processes of the natural world, and it can't deal with questions like meaning and value. And the really important point here is simply that, um, yes, they are different, but that doesn't mean they are in actually in at war with each other. The cultural and intellectual authority of science depends on its absolute neutrality in matters of ethical or political or religious debates. I think that's a very important point. Thomas H. Huxley made this point back in the 1890s when he declared science commits suicide when it adopts a creed. And you know, he's right. If science is hijacked by fundamentalists of some sort, whether they are religious or anti-religious, then its intellectual integrity is subverted and its cultural authority is compromised. So I think one of my views is that the kind of new atheism is really sort of anti-religious fundamentalism. But here's another point. Um, you know, science is a never-ending quest for the best way of understanding our universe. And you know, the way things seem to be today will not be the way they're seen a century from now. I think that's a very important point in dealing with new atheism. After all, remember, 100 years ago, scientists thought that the universe had existed forever, so religious language of creation was simply nonsense. But this is, belief has now been displaced with the equally, uh, with a radically different idea. The universe came into being through the Big Bang. And the key point is this is radically different. It makes creation much more plausible. The philosopher of science Michael Polanyi once very shrewdly observed that scientists believe many things to be true, but they also knew that um, some of those beliefs would be shown to be wrong. But the problem was they weren't quite sure which beliefs those were. Now, I want to emphasize that recognizing the provisionality of scientific theories is not the same as, you know, resigning ourselves or condemning ourselves to some kind of relativism in which each generation or person arbitrarily chooses what it wants to believe. The key point is that theoretical judgments are driven by evidence, and evidence gradually accumulates over time, and gradually it leads to what the historian Thomas Kuhn calls paradigm shift. In other words, radical changes in the way in which we see things. And that point is not controversial in the philosophy of science. But my experience of debating this topic with new atheists suggests that many of them have a very simplistic take on science, believing that science proves beliefs just like atheism does. I think we need to challenge this graciously but firmly. Let's explore this point further. In their heyday, the New Atheists declared on their websites and in their writings that scientific theories are based purely on evidence, whereas religion is about running away from evidence because it's frightened of it. The religion is about the suppression of thinking. It's about, in effect, just accepting things on authority. And Richard Dawkins often argues that there is no need for faith in science because the evidence for a correct conviction compels us to accept its truth. Now, I talked about this earlier, but we do need to come back to this because it is so important. Dawkins first set out his views on this matter in his book, The Selfish Gene, and as far as I can see, he hasn't changed his mind since then. Listen to this. Here's his views on why scientists don't have faith. Faith, he writes, is a state of mind that leads people to believe something, it doesn't matter what, in the total absence of supporting evidence. If there were good supporting evidence, then faith would be superfluous, for the evidence would compel us to believe it anyway. That's a very old-fashioned, discredited scientific positivism. It fails to make the critically important distinction between the, listen carefully, total absence of supporting evidence and the, again listen carefully, absence of totally supporting evidence. They're not the same. Everyone knows that. For example, let's think about the current debate within cosmology over whether the Big Bang gave rise to a single universe 
or lots of universes, the so-called multiverse hypothesis. Which is right? Well, you can't tell because the evidence is ambivalent. It points both ways and neither way. I have many distinguished scientific colleagues who support the former approach and equally distinguished scientific colleagues who support the latter. They're both real options for thinking scientists who will make their decisions on the basis of their judgments about how best to interpret the theoretical evidence. And whatever decision they make, they will believe that their interpretation is correct, but they can't prove it's right. So this process, which is, I have to say, typical of scientific thinking, just doesn't fit in at all well with Dawkins' bold and unsubstantiated declaration that if there were good supporting evidence, then faith would be superfluous, for the evidence will compel us to believe it anyway. That's just not right. Now, interestingly, Dawkins himself clearly believes in the multiverse theory. I think mainly because he thinks that this is less intellectually hospitable to the idea of God. But the evidence for it just isn't good enough to compel him, or indeed anyone else, to accept it. Science just isn't like that. And again, we need to make the point that in the rigorous sense of the word, proof really only applies to logic and mathematics. We can, sure, we can prove 2 and 2 make 4. We can prove that the whole is greater than the part. But we have to avoid confusing provability with truth. Because as I'm sure you know, the great uh, mathematician Kurt Gödel famously proved that however many rules of inference we formulate, there will still be some valid inferences that are not covered by them. In other words, in plain English, there are some statements that are true that we may not be able to show are true. Now, I think this is a very important point to make, uh, and that's why I think we need to highlight the fact that many standard scientific textbooks emphasize that science rests on faith. We make judgments we can't prove to be right. Sure, we have good reason for thinking they are right, but proving them that's a very different thing. Now, most people actually don't have a problem with this because they know that faith is just part of human life and it plays an important role in science as it does everywhere else, for example, in morality and in politics and, of course, in religion. But the new atheism seems to have some kind of aversion to using the word faith. I think Richard Dawkins thinks it denotes some kind of intellectual perversity you only find with religious people. Faith, we're told by Dawkins, is blind faith. Well, no, it's not. Clearly it's not. Belief is just a normal human way of making sense of a complex world where we have varying degrees of evidential support for beliefs. It's not a sort of a binary conclusion, one or zero, true or false. It may be probably or possibly true or false. Science certainly gives us reasons for believing that certain things are true, but at the same time insists we may have to revise this in the future in the light of new evidence or new theoretical trends. Now, there's a very important point to make here. Um, again, we've touched on this, but it's really relevant for new atheism. There are certain things that lie beyond the legitimate scope of the natural sciences. I think a very good example is the non-empirical notions of value and meaning. And we just can't read these off the world as if they are some kind of observables or measure them as if they're the constants of nature. It's been known since the 18th century that there are formidable intellectual obstacles in the way of anyone who wants to argue that science can generate moral values, most notably the impossibility of arguing from observed facts to moral values. That's why David Hume is such an important dialogue partner here. Hume didn't say it was impossible. He said, actually, it's very, very difficult and cannot be done by logic alone. You need bridging beliefs to get you from observation to what should be the case. Now, a new atheist celebrity, Sam Harris, tried to argue otherwise in his book, The Moral Landscape. His argument was that moral values are about promoting human well-being. And since science tells us about what promotes well-being, it can determine moral values. We don't need science or religion, uh, God or religion, because science can tell us what is right. But any philosopher will tell you there are massive problems linked with this kind of approach, and Harris deals with these, basically, by kicking them into the long grass and hoping that nobody will notice. It's a real problem for him, and the result is simply a philosophically lightweight and very deficient view of the foundations of morality. 
And sure, atheist writers do talk about Sam Harris's book on morality. My atheist colleagues at Oxford had rather hoped that Harris would stop ranting against religion and do some serious positive thinking instead. Um, my friends thought that the new atheism really needed to do something to show it could do other than just rage and rant against religion. But actually, unfortunately, this turned out not to be the case. Let's look at the new atheist use of rhetoric in their war against religion. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, the new atheism was great on ridicule, vilification and rhetorical bullying, but actually surprisingly weak on argument. And you know, that strategy seems to have worked. To begin with, the media went along with their rhetoric, you know, somehow failing to ask hard questions about the ideas that lay behind it. Greg Epstein, who was then the humanist chaplain to Harvard University, wrote very caustically about the new atheism's attempts, and I quote, to shame and embarrass people away from religion, browbeating them about the stupidity of belief in a bellicose God. But you know, older atheists like Burton Russell would argue there are difficulties in believing in God, but the new atheists did something rather different. They simply asserted that those who believed in God were dangerous and deluded fools. In other words, they criticized people, not arguments. Uh, I will tell you, in fact, that I was often told by new atheists in the heyday of the movement that I had no business being a professor in a leading British university. After all, I still believed in God, and I was therefore stupid, evil, and mentally unstable. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's just part of the way the movement argued, and happily it's now behind us. But here's the point I want to make. The new atheism discovered that aggressive rhetoric is what their audience really wanted to hear. They wanted to be on the right side of history. And you know, that's one of the reasons why the failure of the new atheism was so devastating to so many people. They began to realize that this movement, which they had trusted, simply didn't have the intellectual and moral credentials it had claimed. Let me refer here to a very intelligent analysis of the demise of new atheism. Uh, which develops these points in more detail. It's from a posting entitled, What Was the New Atheism? Written by the journalist Jacob Hamburger. I want you to note two points he makes. Here's the first one. I quote, In the early 2010s, new atheism was less in the headlines than it had been during its heyday. But at the conferences where the surviving new atheists spoke, and on the online forums where their books were debated, shouting matches regularly broke out over accusations that they were Islamophobic apologists for American empire. In addition, the 2010s also saw an increasing number of polemics concerning sexism within the atheist community, starting with the 2011 episode known as Elevator Gate, in which the feminist um, video logger Rebecca Watson complained of being propositioned in an elevator late at night during an atheist convention, only to be scolded online by Dawkins that women have it far worse under Sharia law. Well, isn't that interesting? I think really what stands out from this analysis by Hamburger is that the new atheism's total focus on our rational and scientific atheism seemed to have blinded them to everything else. In effect, they were completely disconnected from issues of cultural violence, issues of cultural prejudice, and it became disconnected from these wider concerns. And actually, there's another point here, which I think is a very important one to make. I mean, what was the new atheism actually offering other than the critique of religion. I mean, the new atheism didn't offer a viable alternative to religion. In fact, in the view of many of its critics, it actually morphed into its own kind of religion with its prophets and its infallible sacred texts. People like Dawkins and Hitchens and texts like the God Delusion. Many within the movement were actually deeply embarrassed by Sam Harris's interest in Eastern mysticism. Why? Well, because for many new atheists, this seemed to uh, be a concession that the new atheism was missing something rather important. Surely, they argued, Harris ought to have rejected any form of spirituality and simply take delight in the pure rationalism of atheism. But you know, 
Harris had realized that human beings need more than just a rational belief system. They need something that engages with them at a deeper level. And Harris's embracing of Eastern spirituality seemed to show up the existential deficiencies of atheism. Now, Christianity is very good at dealing with these deeper questions, but the new atheism is not. Now, there's a lot more I to say about this aspect of new atheism, but uh, sadly, I just don't have time. Instead, I want to do something which I think is even more interesting, and that is to reflect on you, with you, on what we can learn from the new atheism. It's in our past, but I think we can learn from it. So what can we learn from this interesting episode in Western cultural history, which is now so clearly behind us? Now, I'm going to tell you what I think, but I'm sure you'll have many more ideas that you'd like to add to what I have to say. First of all, for me, the New Atheism offers a highly simplistic message, and this message clearly got through to its audience. Science proves its ideas, religion just makes them up and refuses to consider its evidence. There's only one way of dealing with this, and that is, frankly, to say this is simplistic nonsense. Science does not prove all of its ideas. The evidence is quite clear that science is a matter of judgments, deciding what the best interpretation of the evidence might be, but often not being able to prove this. But here's the main point I want to make. The really big questions in life, the questions which really engage people, are about God, the meaning of life, and the quest for goodness and happiness. And everyone knows these cannot be settled empirically or rationally. That's just the way it is. And that's the point emphasized by the Oxford academic Sir Isaiah Berlin in his famous lecture of 1988, entitled The Pursuit of the Ideal. And Berlin here offered a demolition of those who, and I quote Berlin here, have, by their own methods, arrived at clear and unshakable convictions about what to do and what to be that brook no possible doubt. And Berlin was simply scathing about the foundations and the implications of this kind of intellectual arrogance, which amounted to little more than wish fulfilment. Let me quote from Berlin's lecture again. I can only say that those who rest on such comfortable beds of dogma are victims of forms of self-induced myopia, blinkers that make for contentment, but not for understanding of what it is to be human. That's a very powerful criticism, and I think it's very important to see where Berlin takes this point, because Berlin declared we had to recognize a plurality of rationally defensible understanding of human values, which were often inconsistent with each other raising the question of how you and I can live alongside those who come to quite different conclusions from us. And Berlin's experience of logical positivism at Oxford during the 1930s led him to conclude that while the scientific method is essential to our understanding of the natural world, we simply can't use it for fundamental questions of value and meaning. And Berlin's point is that while these values cannot be verified scientifically or logically. They are simply essential to human life and culture. Now, the New Atheists just don't get this. They see life in really simplistic terms. It's either their rather distorted form of scientific rationalism, which they argue is capable of delivering simple certainties about life, or it's about the random ramblings of religious people who run away from the evidence and refuse to think about their faith. Well, that's nonsense. What about people like C.S. Lewis, who thought about their faith and can easily undermine the credibility of their arguments? Or Richard Swinburne, to give another. I think you and I need to challenge this evasion of reality. Religion is not like that. Neither are religious people. There are very good reasons, and they're better than the reasons provided by the New Atheism. And here's another point. The New Atheism offered a very simplistic criticism of religion, but actually had nothing to offer in its place. Perhaps, I think, because they realised that any positive suggestions they made could be criticised on precisely the same grounds that they criticised religion 
for peddling false and unprovable certainties. Now, there's much more needs to be said here, but I hope you found what I said helpful. I think a new atheism is really interesting. It's a case study we can learn a lot from it. Look at the websites I've quoted. You'll get a lot of ideas from doing that. But now we need to move on, prepare to bring this series of lectures to a close. And in my final lecture, I'm going to be reflecting on how you can develop your own distinct approach to apologetics and put it to good use. So I look forward to speaking to you again very soon.